Hello everyone. I'm down on the lower level right now in what is the junior high crossover space and it is newly remodeled and being used and it looks incredible. Some of you might, might be looking at the background saying, wait, is that teal? Yes, it is. So apparently nobody listened to me when I said we're not putting teal and mauve in this new building and here we sit. But it does, I have to admit, look good. Well, today's text, we're going to be going into a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And what Paul is addressing in this text are some concerns about this church in Corinth. It was a pretty lively church, uh, likely the first charismatic church of the early church movement uh, in the sense of it being the descriptor that would describe the whole. And part of Paul's concern is making sure that the values of how we gather as a church uh, drip down through the entire aspect of our corporate gatherings. And, and so it, out of concern for some of the practices of the church where there are many things in this chapter that I am not going to address today. Uh, we do not have enough time to do so. Uh, but in this, he's dealing with uh, prophets speaking regularly, people sh shouting from their chairs, uh, speaking in tongues uh, without interpretations. Many different things were going on uh, within the context of the church in Corinth. But he wanted to speak and give some direction on the appropriate uses of all those things by dripping some important values into it. And that's what I want to extract out of the text and be able to communicate now for our discussion today. So in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26, Paul says this, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So everything that happens in a corporate gathering, uh, worship service, from the stage and also from the pew, if you will, uh, is to build up the church. It's not for self-indulgence. It's not for self-proclamation. It's not uh, to idolize anybody other than Christ and Christ alone. So it is a glorifying of God gathering and a for the purpose of also strengthening the church. So when Paul's about to give some instructions about how they need to do things differently, he's reminding them, this is so that the church can be strengthened together. Then he goes on um, in verse 32, he says, The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace, as in all congregations of the Lord's people. So that's the second thing he drips into this, that's a guiding value. He, he's already said, you know, the church is to be a place where it is strengthened. We glorify God together, we worship God together, but the church gathers corporately to do that, to be strengthened. But when we do that, the way we do that is through peace. And because God is a God of peace, and he references this idea of prophets referring to prophets. And, and what was going on is prophets were shouting down prophets. It's not that what they were saying was inappropriate. It was how they were doing it. Uh, they were talking over the top of each other. It kind of... That's what's going to happen at some of our Thanksgiving tables uh, in the next few days, is talking over the top and in the church that should not be, for God is not a God that would order things that way. He's a God of peace. So the spirit by how we gather should be peaceful and not this uh, shouting each other down. Um, so it's to worship God together for the strengthening of the church and done in a peaceful spirit because that represents God's peace and his character well. So our gatherings need to reflect who God is, not something else. And so he doesn't talk over the top of people. He talks through and on point and clearly without others interfering. Then Paul concludes with this statement, which is kind of implicit to the other two statements, which is, but everything should be done then in a fitting and orderly way. So we gather together as a church to be strengthened as we worship God together. We do it peacefully, not shouting each other down, not intrusively, but together 
orderly, and as he says, in a fitting and orderly manner. So we have a high value as we gather as a church to make sure that God is glorified by the way we worship, by the way we teach, and then by the way we interact with one another. So we want to protect those values as we gather on campus here corporately, that the church is strengthened. We do so peacefully and there is order. So planning, preparation uh, are part of that which can build towards peaceful gatherings where we are strengthened. So in light of that, I want to best prepare you for how to enter our facilities this coming weekend. You know, throughout the past several months, we've dealt with the journeys of the ebbs and flows of a pandemic. We have scratched our heads at times, like wondering what to do in this context or what to do in that context or in this season versus that season. And along the way, we've mostly felt like we have honored God with what we have done and that we feel like we also were prudent and wise and we were caring for people as we were doing it. Now we recognize that not everybody's gonna agree with how we've done it, uh, but I believe the spirit has been peaceful and our gatherings have been peaceful and I believe our gatherings have, have definitely been orderly, peaceful, and have strengthened the church. I couldn't be more pleased with the last several months of the fruit and the presence and the spirit that, of our gatherings here at LEFC. And yet, even that, with all that's going around on society, with the unrest of the political aspect of things, and with the neighborhoods and the cities uh, having basically divisions, uh, I believe we've had a peaceful, unified spirit here. But my heart has been troubled more so in the last few days as I've begun to watch uh, our hospitals fill up. And I begin to wonder what will our government do? Because I know that was the greatest concern back in the spring and, and, it, and we never realized it, which I'm thankful for. Our, our hospitals remain fairly empty in Lancaster County in particular. But it's beginning to fill up. One of our staff members who has extended family in, in another part of Pennsylvania shared how this one family member who is whose life is at risk right now significantly and is and needs to be in a hospital and there are no hospital beds available for this individual. And that was a, you know, an alarming reality that as we're praying for this family member, it's like, this is a life or death type of a health issue. And they can't even get a hospital bed because of how much of a spike COVID has hit that part of our state. And it's beginning to f do the same here in Lancaster County. And so I knew that we were likely to hear or receive new new instructions and restrictions to how we operate publicly. And those things did happen this week. And, and my heart uh, goes out to those who are in that situation. I've had uh, people I'm connected to that have missed out on, on important surgeries because of the hospitals being shut down uh, during the first go around. And so I can't imagine what could happen this go around if indeed the beds are full. So we have a responsibility um, of consideration of how do we love our neighbors? How do we care for people in this time? Yet at the same time, gather peaceably with the right spirit, with order for the strengthening of the church. And so the elders met on Tuesday night uh, and spent time in the word, spent time in prayer, to spend time in discussion, working through what should we do. We feel good about what we've done thus far and we feel like we've honored people as we've gone. So at this moment, we're like, what do we do for this season? And I believe that as we've considered what's the most loving thing we can do, what is the most wise thing we can do, and how can we uh, you know, partner with society in turning this around for the sake of everyone, we believe that we need to just, at least for the short term, uh, become an, a mask only campus. Based on the current guidelines and restrictions, we believe that's being compliant. We also think it's being wise and loving. And so we want to share that with you, recognizing that that is going to need to be something prayed over by every household 
about their response to this change of how we gather. We will presume that you will still be willing to come. But we also recognize it will, you know, it's, it's more restrictive. We don't like that. Um, it is a hindrance. Nobody enjoys the mass, but we believe this to be wise and most loving. And so we're going to create an environment that is peaceful, that is orderly, and will strengthen the church. And we believe that is best done when all of us pull together in the same spirit of understanding and, uh, and we will do this together. So I share that to prepare your heart. It's something we hope is short term, especially as it does appear that uh, the pandemic side of this only has a few months to go. And, uh, and likely things will be lessened and less restrictive in the future. I do not believe this to be as long as the last season of such restrictions, uh, but those are all the unknowns. But for now, we believe this is the wisest and most loving thing that we as elders can decide for our church. And so pray for us, pray for our gatherings, pray that they are safe, and pray for our people, that they will enter with the same spirit of peace that we desire. Peace doesn't mean that you have to agree with it. Uh, but we do believe that out of respect to what God calls us to do, which is to love others beyond ourselves, uh, that this is the best thing we can do as a church. So to give us that proper spirit, I want to conclude with something that Paul also says in 1 Corinthians, but it's just prior to the chapter I read, and this is in chapter 10 when he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So when we gather, we're going to do it to the glory of God. We should not then cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as we try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. So follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So I believe the heart of the matter is that we're to provide an example that does not distort the view of who Christ is. He is a peaceful one, he is a loving one, and it's not about my own personal comforts. I do this for the good of the many, uh, not for the good of myself. I do this for the good of the many so that there are no barriers for someone to be saved. And so if we flaunt our freedoms, at this time, I do believe that could potentially be a barrier to the gospel and a distortion of the spirit of Christ. So while I might have my own personal concerns about restrictions of a mask, I do believe the right spirit and tenor in representing Christ is to do what we are asking to be done. So pray for us, pray that this will be no barriers to the gospel and a great example of the spirit of Christ. That is our intent. And we trust that the spirit of God within you will understand and at least resonate with that message, if not for the agreement of being wise and prudent at this time. God bless, and I hope to see you on Sunday.